usually Mickey's telling me I'm not close enough to the microphone, but I think this is a better way. I want to first say what a pleasure it's been to have these two guys come to our house to practice with Debbie. As I hear her playing just the piano part, and it's good. <laughs> it's good that when you hear all three of them together, plus they're really amazing guys. I think Wes speaks four or five languages, and uh, Bob is such an expert musician, and his dad made his cello. Yeah, not that too many people can say that. So welcome. I wasn't sure how big of a crowd we would have after not being live for the last two years. Um, but here we are. And let's see, here's the program. feel comfortable and to make it, all the people feel comfortable in it and deal with whatever comes up. Um, we have a great guest coming up in a few minutes, Pius, and Mickey helped get him here. Um, so, one of Mickey's many talents. I also want to uh, thank Pete Bates. Could you stand up for a minute? Pete! Pete. <laughs> Virtual Power of Poetry last year. Pete's the one that made it happen on the technical end and really handed to him for that. And he also came up to me virtually last year, literally in tears, saying, Where was this stuff all of my life? You should do Wellspring. That's a program we do for young people. He said, You should do Young Wellspring for old people. <laughs> so Carrie and Evie and I did Wellsprung. <laughs> we did it last fall and it was really a great program and we'll be doing it again. Yay. We'll bring people back to the Two of our Wellsprungers here. Marcia, Amy and Susan. Marsha. Me. Yeah, I said Marsha. Allison. 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 Yeah. Thanks to Allison who always films these and she'll be putting it on YouTube for us. So, um, I usually start these things off with a little poetry sermonette, and that's not going to happen tonight. There have been a few people, um, two of them actually, and then it's the anniversary for two other people who have died in the last couple years that have been very instrumental in my life, and I wanted to honor them a little bit. Um, they're my ancestors now. And the first one is Maladoma Somme from Burkina Faso. His name literally means makes friends with the stranger. And Maladoma came here to teach the wisdom of his people, the Dagara. He hit me with an especially difficult time in my life. I was a fifth grade teacher, sixth grade teacher. And I was having a group of kids that year that would not respond to any of the old tried and true things I did. And Maladoma came up with this idea that started with tribal people, went up through Plato into the present, that everyone comes into this world with a unique gift. <coughs> and depending on where you come from, there's a different mythology, whether you 
hug the tree of forgetfulness or step in the river of forgetfulness, you don't know what this gift is when you're born. A good culture helps people find it, helps the young people find it. Young people are our greatest resource, their imaginations. And schools, I don't think, do a great job with them, though there are some young people, as you'll see in a few moments, that rise to the top anyway. Um, so, I'm going to read a couple quotes from Maladama just to give you a little feel from him. He died, what, two months ago, Michael, something like that? Hmm? Four months ago. And it was a great loss. He's, he's been all over the world. It seems like old times. Yep. <laughs> all over the world teaching um, the wisdom of his people. He says, whether they are raised in indigenous or modern culture, there are two things that people crave. The full realization of their innate gifts and to have these gifts approved, acknowledged, and confirmed. There are countless people in the West whose efforts are sadly wasted because they have no means of expressing their unique genius. In the psyches of such people, there is an inner power and authority that fails to shine because the world around them is blind to it. So something we could all do is if we see this in someone, especially young people, let them know that we see them. The clock tells you everything and keeps you busy enough to forget that there could be another way of living your life. And as long as we are not ourselves, we will try to be what other people are. The second person I'd like to honor is Barry Lopez. Anybody familiar with him? He's a writer, uh, especially about things with the natural world. And Barry's writings inspired me, and I pulled Evie along with some of them. We didn't have to pull very hard to uh, go to the Arctic, to go to the canyons of the Southwest. Um, have a lot of great adventures. I was lucky enough to get to correspond with him for a while and to meet him. Everything is held together with stories, he says. That is all that is holding us together, stories and compassion. The land is like poetry. It is inexorably coherent. It is transcendent in its meaning, and it has the power to elevate the consideration of human life. We cannot, of course, save the world because we do not have authority over its parts. We can serve the world, though. That is everyone's calling, to lead a life that helps. And this is from a book that supposedly is a children's book, but it's not just for children. It's called um, Badger, what's it? Weas Badger and Weasel. Um, Remember this one thing, said Badger. The stories people tell have a way of taking care of them. If stories come to you, care for them and learn to give them away where they are needed. Sometimes a person needs a story more than food to stay alive. That is why we put these stories in each other's memories. This is how people care for themselves. To allow mystery, which is to say to yourself, there could be more, things we don't understand, is not to damn knowledge, it is to permit yourself an extraordinary freedom. Someone else does not have to be wrong in order that you might be right. This tolerance for mystery invigorates the imagination, and it is the imagination that gives shape to the universe. We keep each other alive with our stories. We need to share them as much as we need to share food. We also require for our health the presence of good companions. One of the most extraordinary things about the land is that it knows this and it compels language from some of us that as a community we may <coughs> converse about this or that place and speak of the need. And finally from Barry. Eden is a conversation. It is a conversation of the human with the divine. 
and it is the reverberations of that conversation that create a sense of place. It is not a thing, Eden, but a pattern of relationships made visible in conversation. To live in Eden is to live in the midst of good relations or just relations scrupulously attended to, imaginatively maintained through time. Altogether, we call this beauty. You know, this is about the fifth anniversary of the death of our friend Greg Kimura, who graced us here a number of times with his poetry. And Greg was also strongly influenced by Maladoma. A lot of you have heard this poem, but I would like to read it. To think of Greg, it's called Cargo. And there are some posters over there that are there for anyone that wants one, and needs one. Evie did the collage that's on there, and Greg did this poem. It's called Cargo. You enter life a ship laden with meaning, purpose, and gifts sent to be delivered to a hungry world. And as much as the world needs your cargo, you need to give it away. Everything depends on this. But the world forgets its needs, and you forget your mission, and the ancestral maps used to guide you have become faded scrawls on the parchment of dead pharaohs. The cargo weighs you heavy the longer it is held, and spoilage becomes a risk. Your ship sputters from port to port, and at each you ask, is this the way? But the way cannot be found without knowing the cargo, and the cargo cannot be known without recognizing there is a way, and it is simply this. You have gifts. The world needs your gifts. You must deliver them. The world may not know it is starving, but the hungry know, and they will find you when you discover your cargo and start to give it away. And Dave Lee, one of our poets over there, handsome devil, <laughs> turned me on to an author about five or six years ago, named Brian Doyle. Is anybody familiar with him? And Brian died a year after, or a month after Greg, of the same kind of a brain tumor. Um, his writing is amazing, and he was gonna come here. I had talked to him, and he couldn't come that year, but then he died. So his words will be here tonight. Um, he was the editor of a magazine for Portland College, is it college or university? Either way, I don't know. But, um, and he, he has these magnificent books of essays. And uh, I think some of you are gonna wanna read some of them after you hear a few things that he said. I am here for sunlight and hawks and the way dragonflies and damselflies do that geometric astounding zigzag thing in the air totally effortlessly, which absolutely knocks me out, and I've spent many hours staring at them in a trance, explaining to people that I am conducting a scientific project. They look at me oddly, and I am here to hear the thrushes in late winter, just heard one tonight, first one, and to gape at osprey and to taste my way judiciously through excellent red wines from countries where the sun shines, and to shuffle humming through the rain gentle and ancient and patient and persistent and holier than we ever admit, and to hear and ferment together the coolest sound there is, and to witness grace under duress that more than anything. He's kind of allergic to periods. And one time his brother for Christmas gave him a few pages with just periods. I've often thought that I'm the luckiest guy on earth for any number of reasons, starting with being born American of Irish ancestry in New York. What a combination of swaggering cultural confidence and addiction to tall tales and the music of stories and the insistence that creative energy can jolt the universe. And then I was a middle child balanced between the weight of expectation and too much independence. And I was a child of the middle class 
and so was fed and clothed and safe and educated, and no one shot at me. And in college, I woke up a little spiritually and mentally and socially, and then shuffled on into a life utterly absorbed by stories. Their swing and cadence and bone and song, and a cool woman married me, and I've had a sweet, confusing, painful, delightful, mysterious marriage that is different every 11 minutes, which is riveting and frustrating and riveting. And we were graced with all these children, some of them twins who move so fast, I'm never quite sure how many twins there are in the house at all. And I love them to work that has everything to do with listening and hearing stories and catching stories and shaping stories and sharing stories. And at age 50, I conclude that I was born and made for stories. I am a story man. I believe with all my hoary heart that stories save lives and the telling and hearing of them is a holy thing, powerful, far beyond our ken, sacramental, crucial, nutritious. Without the sea of stories in which we swim, we would wither and die, and we are here for each other to touch and be touched, to lose our tempers and beg forgiveness, to listen and to tell, to hail and farewell, to laugh and to snarl, to use words as knives and caresses, to puncture lies and to heal what is broken. So that's Brian Doyle. Poetry, stories, music all come from what the Celtic people call the other world. The world just like this one, only more so. It's the way it was explained to me. Where anything could happen. And tonight is a great example. We had that wonderful music, had the words from these amazing guys. And the next part of our program, I'm going to introduce Pius as they come up, please, Pius. Pius is this year's state, Ohio State. Poetry Out Loud champion will be competing in the semifinal for the yes. pretty soon, and then well, uh, yeah, it's not and, and then the he'll be on the nationals. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> pre COVID, these young people got to all go to Washington D.C. and meet each other and have a fun there. However, now it's virtual, so I'm sure you'll make the most of that. Oh yeah. So, um, <laughs> if you'd like to just say a little about that. How's everybody doing? Oh, uh, yeah. I am Pius Edzi. I am in high school. I'm a senior, and I go to St. Francis de Sales. I live all the way east. It took us like 30, 30 minutes to get here, and <laughs> we've been running around in circles. So, pardon me. Yeah. Um, I got into poetry. Uh, by my, my English teacher introduced me to poetry. And I didn't even know I was interested before I started, you know, investing myself in doing it. And I competed, um, I think, uh, I did my school competition and I won. And then I went on to the regionals and thank God I won that too. <laughs> and then I went to States and I won that too. Yes, and now since he said, um, COVID, we can go to Washington, D.C. We did it virtual, so we had to record our video, and I recorded mine on the, I don't remember the day, but it's okay. I recorded mine, and um, I sent it to the people, and matter of fact, it's gonna stream next week, Sunday, at 6 p.m. Yes, they're gonna choose nine people out of the 50 people to compete in the finals, and, <laughs> Ohio is the second contestant. So y'all gonna be there at six on the dock. <laughs> yeah, and, um, I love poetry, as Alan said. Um, poetry is beautiful. And I'm sure all, all everybody in here is here to um, take some joy out of poetry, you know? Like, it's, it's beautiful, you know? Like the same thing with music and everything like that. I think this poetry is very beautiful. And I, I thank you guys for having me here. I really appreciate it. Can y'all put it on? So first, I'm gonna start off with my 
an ode to my mother. I wrote this poem back in junior year, and I hope you guys like it. to my mother. Blessed is the womb that made you. Blessed is the womb that made your callous hands, scarred face, and tired arms. Because on August 1969, God breathing you wind and fire and formed you out of his ribs. Blessed is the womb that made your body body built like a warship to secure the army of legions. As an eagle spreads its wings to produce, to produce shade for his chicks, like a polar bear shields his cups from predators, so do you from harm. Let me take you back in time. Ravana 69 introduced you to this kind of woman who sleeps with one eye open, unbroken, who hates to show emotion. My mother is a soldier, my shining sword and shield, my gladiator, showing deathless courage in the midst of storms. She's like Maximus, miraculous. Her beauty is fabulous. Thank you. I really love this one. Have, my mother hasn't even heard this yet. <laughs> so you guys are the first audience to hear this. My mother hasn't even heard this yet. So I, uh, as, a, as I said, I wrote this poem in junior year. Um, we had to write this for an assignment, and I had to read it in class, and they really loved it. Yeah, and um, as the poem says, my mother's a really strong person, and I, she has taught me a lot. She has raised, she raised, we have three siblings. I have three sisters, I'm the only boy in my family. <laughs> and she, she uh, has done a lot for us. Not to forget my dad as well. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate my mother and I love her so much. Like, really, really. Yeah. All righty. It's good to hear some poetry, y'all. <laughs> um, this is the second poem I wrote back in junior year, as I said. I wasn't really interested in poetry. I started really writing in junior year, back in sophomore year. If anybody would. I, I wouldn't think if anybody told me to go do poetry, I would go do it. Because I wasn't the type of kid to like stand in front of a big crowd and you know perform. I was like the shy kid, you know, like always, you know, quiet to myself. I keep to myself. That was me in high school, and I really never thought I would be up here, you know, reciting poem, poems to you guys. And this is really this is a gift from God, and I I I appreciate that. So I'm using this gift, you know to bless people, to bless y'all. So y'all lucky, <laughs> everybody here, you know. Um, this is the second poem I wrote called, Our Children, Our Future. Our children, our future, they say. Our children, our leaders of today. Well, how can we be leaders if we're not allowed to be heard? How can we be leaders if our ideas are considered inferior, being groomed to follow the herd? Speak up for yourself. Stand up for yourself, they say. But when we do so, we're considered rebellious, ungovernable, and even chaotic. Our confidence is mistaken for aggression. There's no middle ground between us and our parents. They're always right, and we're always wrong. They don't seek to understand us so we don't bother to see their perspective. Teach a child the way he should go. Nobody taught us. We had to learn on our own. You can't blame the youth. I would never understand this corrupted society. First they praise me and then lie to me. The products of a corrupted breed. Now the hypocrisy that lies between our children, our future, is evident to you and me. Thank you. Um, 
as I was growing up, I, um, I didn't get along with my parents as a typical teenager as I am. I'm sure we, when we were all kids, we didn't get along with our parents. And um, uh, the reason why I wrote this poem was because I felt like I didn't have a, like a, I didn't have the personal connection that you know teenagers have usually have with their parents or we were on the same plane. So I wrote this poem to express that feeling that I had. And um, I'm sure you'll like it. <laughs> yeah, that, thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate it. Um, as I said, I don't really write like that, but I, I try, I try my best. And this is a very short one, at least. Uh, I hope you like it. It's called Ode to Love. They flawed me with whips and left my skin stripped. I was beat with their instruments rhythmically, which caused my skin to bleed symphonies for your love. Yet you do not see the man in me. You only see a silhouette. She loves me. She loves me not. State Finals, and I hope you guys really enjoy this. This is one of my favorite poems. I'm sure you guys know Carl Sandburg. Anybody here know Carl Sandburg? Yes, yes, yeah. I, I think you are very familiar with this poem. Uh, I am the people of the mob. Does that sound familiar? I Am the People, The Mom, by Carl Semper. I am the people, the mob, the crowd, the mass. Do you know that all the great work of the world is done through me? I am the working man, the inventor, the maker of the world's food and clothes. I am the audience that witnesses history. The Napoleons come from me and the Lincolns. They die. And then I send forth more Napoleons and Lincolns. I am the seed ground. I am a prairie that will stand for much plowing. Terrible storms pass over me. I forget. The best of me is sucked out wasted. I forget. Everything but death comes to me and makes me work and give up what I have and I forget. Sometimes I growl, shake myself and spatter a few red drops for history to remember. Then I forget. When I, the people, learn to remember. When I, the people, use the lessons of yesterday and no longer forget who robbed me last year, who played me for a fool. Then there will be no speaker in all the world, say the name, the people, with any fleck of a sneer in his voice or any far smile of derision. The mob, the crowd, the mass will arrive then. Thank you. Thank you guys. I'm sure we all can relate. We're all working people out here. We work so much. Like, I know my parents work so much and I don't really, you know, get appreciated. Like we are like the baseline of this 
you know, the world, right? The upper class run this whole world. We just, we just work it, you know? They take all our money, we work it. We are the most important people, the working people. Not the people in the, you know, the stocks, trading stocks and stuff like that. We are the people. And that's, that means something. And when we don't exist, nothing, everything collapses. Because we, when we come together and we work and we come together and we bring unity in us, like, it really, it really builds up things. And we, together as we, the people, can be successful by working hard and and showing people that we are the people. Like the poem said, we are the people. So we should be recognized for the stuff that we do and we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be um, underrated. And everybody in here should know that. And that's basically what the poem says. So I hope you would like it. <laughs> Seymour. I've watched her um, evolve from somebody who was a little nervous and about doing her work and just blossomed. She's just been appoint reappointed uh, Poet Laureate of the State of Ohio. Um, she's done all these magnificent things. <laughs> magnificent projects. Um, she we talked about those a little when you come up. And there's a new book here that's an anthology that she's instrumental in putting together. And, um, Carrie worked with Debbie and I. Maybe I worked with Carrie and Debbie. <laughs> and we did, did the Wellspring program, and it's just a pleasure to have her here. So, Carrie. Presbyterians, 
donating books and endowment, $28 a month to any woman with a horse or mule and the spunk to stand up for progress, break the weather, backwaters and hollers, to deliver emancipation by means of bound dissertation. <laughs> you need to understand this was Appalachia just before the war to end all wars. Only women of disrepute were considered working women by the church. Christian women labored in the kitchen and the fields, burned, prayed, died in them. Albeit, many Christian women were taught to read, if for no other reason than the Lord's word could be used to hold her back. <laughs> but this was the new deal and all bets were off. Imagine my grandmother, top of her head barely level with the saddle's front rigging beam, flaming red hair, a brand of sass all her own, packing up at the Pine Mountain Settlement School, Harlan County, creek beds as roads, on foot, single fire file across crag and cliff top, sleeping in barns and lean-tos against the cold. Deliberate as any lineman or mail carrier, every treatise she carried, a nugget of gold inside her saddle. Impatient with my niggling. I quarry my roots, 
Dig in like my great-grandfather's oxen dragging a crusty plow. A need in my belly, sagas flashing against my back. My stories, my people, crossing a cratered land, a pregnant woman, steadfast and twanged, a thick-muscled man, far-sighted, timbered the land, planted seeds, prayed for rain, the soil, so rich, so rife with possibility. So she's, they're one of that group of 
uh, northern uh, of uh, Ohio Appalachians that went north for work during the war or during the war to find work in factories. Now, I want you to remember these are farm women. These are young women just out of high school. Farm women. You didn't leave the farm unless you were going to another farm because you got married. Or maybe because you were a spinster and you were looking for some work, right? But nobody, nobody moved and got their own home and, you know, went to work in the factories. So again, this is where I come from. These are the women that I look up to. These are the women that are in my blood and imprinted in me. Um, so I had to, of course, write a, a poem for them, and of course I've written many, but this is, this is one. And I also included uh, Dolly Parton, because for us, Dolly Parton is our Gloria Steinem. So I had to throw her in there, of course. And this is called Perfect Pitch. I rode middle school bound in the back seat of my mama's station wagon, listened to her and my aunt sing Jolene, <laughs> trading verses, harmonizing on the chorus. I'm begging of you, please don't take my man. <laughs> A few years later, it was nine to five. They were fired up, and it was dollars doing. This was Northern Appalachia. The bottom lip of northern Ohio, right shy of Perry Como country. <laughs> the women in the factory, excuse me, the women in the family worked the T.S. Trim factory, spitting out Honda car parts. Started out on the assembly line, worked their way up to paint, then detailing, then welding. The physical labor made their bodies strong, their future bright. And like Dolly, they weren't taking any shit. <laughs> they learned early on about stripes and picket lines, how important it was to organize and vote. Brave women in the workforce, determined to see their daughters inside college classrooms, the hell out of factory row. I didn't know then I was being raised by a feminist taking back her power. Like Dolly, my mama never would use that word no matter how much she embodied it. She was proud to hang up her welder's helmet in the shift, pick up her paycheck, sing in the front seat of a station wagon with the women she loved. <laughs> Tonight, I'm sending this one out to the mothers. Excuse me. In Ukraine. And this is six months into your deployment. I wake to flat hair. The tug of time spidering across my reflection, tightening over my forehead's bone. Beyond the drafty glass sit yellowed fields and ruined gardens. A lone bird pecks at some once seated thing. I'm a brittle leaf trapped against a wire fence. A trickle of rusty water teasing, like the sense of something waiting to unfold, leaving only the weight. I conjure what ifs, consider omens. I beg strangers to pray for you. make absurd promises to God.
photography, and people ask how that ever brought me to poetry, and I always say, well, graphic designers try to organize information, right? And photographers capture a moment. And so that's a poet. <laughs> so I guess that's how I became a poet. And so anyway, I make these little broadsides just to capture the poem and the art. And I just love doing that. And, um, and we've all had a rough couple of years. As Alan pointed out, we're coming together for the first time in a couple of years. And this makes number 19. Isn't that amazing? 19 years Alan and Evie have been doing this. It's just, it's so tremendous. Shake off this inexplicable sadness. Two cinder blocks their lungs ought to be. Let spring hold on to me for a while.
off beneath lightning to gather up the chickens. But Lorraine, can't you see her dance? Rain never speaks for no one with disdain. Her lips have never touched champagne. And she don't mind it. <laughs> Thank you so much. As we go into break, I'm going to work on closing the windows. They make a lot of noise. 